My name is Steve Adamko, and I am a professional interior designer, plus the owner and founder of Spectrum Interiors, established in 1982, based in Kalamazoo and Portage, Michigan. All right, folks, this is going to be a wonderful time, and we're going to be talking about the importance of a master plan for your residential interior design. This is going to be a great one, folks. This is going to be awesome. So, let's get started. The importance of a master plan for your interior design project or projects is of vital importance. The reason for this is that your money and your time are two of the things that are inseparable. It is critical that your time, your money, and your resources are allocated properly. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have. If someone says, I've got $1,000 to spend, that could be a lot of money for them. If another person says, I've got $10,000 to spend, that might be a lot of money for that individual to spend. Even if someone has $100,000 to spend, that is still a lot of money to them. And lastly, Even if it's $1 million for a multimillionaire, it's still a significant amount of money to spend, or let's say, invest. So, do you want to just spend the money, or do you really want to invest the money? The answer is, I hope, rather obvious. You want to invest the money because you want a return on your investment in more ways than one. You want a return on your investment emotionally, intellectually, and visually for maximum impact and personal enrichment. Having a master plan helps orchestrate all the components that go into producing great interior design. If you're working on a single room, you have to orchestrate all the different furniture pieces as well as the accessories. If you're working on a whole house, you need to transition in different areas and have some relatedness. A master plan helps you successfully accomplish that. A master plan is also about the importance of words. Here I'm talking about the intangible things first because the intangibles almost always precede the tangibles. Someone has an idea and then it eventually becomes a reality. But the correct words will frame the concept and the concept will frame the reality. Another very important thing is to have your master plan on paper because without having it documented, you can't look at it. You can't ponder it and you can't meditate or think on it. This is the aspect that can get you excited because it's your vision and it takes some thought and pondering. Always remember, whether it's a house you have right now or whether it's a house you plan to build or buy, you will always be working within the context of its architecture. Both the interior design and the architecture should act together as a quote-unquote hand-in-glove scenario. This analogy relates to the fit, feel, and appropriateness of the interior design with regard to the architecture. In this relationship, the architecture exists to contain or house the interior. The interior is the hand and the architecture is the glove. And it's the hand that animates the glove, making it come alive. I love architecture. And before I got into interior design, I was going to be an architect. And I love building and carpentry. But I realized later on that for every given facade, for every given building, There's a multitude of things that you can do with the interior that would still be conducive to the architectural surround, would still be in concert with it, which is ever so important. But we live in the interior, and most people have a harder time envisioning the architecture of a building, its volume and form and all of that. I mean, Most people can relate to the things that affect them directly. A master plan is very much like a master key. The master key opens all the doors. A master plan could also be thought of as 
and orchestrating aspect. You have a symphony, you have the orchestra conductor, you have the players, but everybody looks to the orchestra conductor to direct the whole show, to direct the whole performance of the piece. So this is very important to have an overall concept about where you're going to start, what kind of processes you're going to implement, and how you're going to get there and what the final result is going to be. So that is one of the things that's so very important to having a master plan. It's the master. So it helps tremendously to forge things and to lay it out in a pattern or process that makes sense. Because a lot of times people can start something and without a full concept or let's say a master plan of how things are going to be allocated, they run into a mess of problems. And this can happen when someone's doing remodeling, especially. One needs to get a handle on the direction you're going because If it's not handled correctly, you don't have the congruity or things aren't as congruous as they should be. They aren't put in order and in balance and relatedness that architecture needs to have. Rooms and transitions are all components of the master plan. A master plan also helps to unite the architecture with the interior. Because sometimes you have to kind of recalibrate a house or even an apartment in terms of adjusting the proportions, the scale. Doors might need to be moved to better increase the flow in a space, to increase the balance, to make things work more functionally correct, to provide backdrops for people and things. That's where the classical sense of order and balance needs to be an essential element to achieving a particular aspect of style. And I don't mean that style has to be a particular style, but style in the the perception of, you know, grace and well-designed things that seem to be so well-balanced, they seem effortless and beautiful and enjoyable. The master plan is applicable, whether it's a one room, or whether it's a multi-room home. But in home design, you know, there's a certain demanding and challenging aspect and also a very richly satisfying aspect because the home is a very personal interaction between the occupants and their environment. So that can be intimate, intense, varied. It mirrors the people who live there. As a matter of fact, The quality of your thinking in regards to the master plan affects the quality and character of your home, which in turn affects the quality of your life, your feelings, and other people that are part of that environment. So the quality of a home is going to depend on the spirit and the vision that goes into it. Your master plan is very much akin to a roadmap as well. You want to safely get to where you're going. There is going to have to be some quality, effort, and thought that goes into a master plan because it is the master plan. You want to have a plan that expresses the real you, not like a hundred other people who haven't even thought about it because there are so many homes that are just impersonal. And exactly like a million other homes, we've got so much of this. And so many people, because of a misunderstanding of how design really is supposed to be addressed, they follow fads and trends that they shouldn't even be following. I mean, we're bombarded by lots of images, particularly of people who really don't know how to design well. We see a lot of average and mediocre design. And so when you think of a master plan, what comes to my mind also is masterful. So think of all the things that encompass the word master. 
or masterful or a guiding light or captain of the ship, whatever, master of the circumstance, master of the architecture, master of the interior design. So really, we need to have people working on those aspects that are masters of their craft for maximum enjoyment. The home is such a large investment that it is necessary to put the time and effort into it. And most of the problems come because someone or a group of people don't really understand what it's all about, or they don't even know themselves well enough. You know, great interior design comes about by understanding yourself and what you want, because otherwise you can get easily led astray. So let's take a look at, first off, one room. Let's just call it the master plan for the master bedroom. So what are the overriding concepts that would come to your mind when thinking about a master plan? Well, one of the first things would be you want a romantic environment, particularly if you're married. You also want to have an atmosphere of restfulness or serenity. You also want to feel luxurious. So the types of materials would come into play. You want to orchestrate that. And it's not so much getting down to, which I see this a lot, color schemes. Okay, that's only one aspect of an orchestrated environment. So again, think of music. It's not just the instruments, the colors of the instruments. It's about notes. It's about chords. It's about point, counterpoint. It's about a whole bunch of other things. Ambiance, the mood, the emotion to be elicited by the piece. So again, it's all about what do we want to promote? How do we want this environment to look and feel? How do we want to feel within the environment? How do we want to be perceived in the environment? So let's say, you know, the master bedroom. What types of materials are going to add to the effect? I think a lot of bedrooms look rather banal. They have, um, what would you call it? Like matchy, matchy, like, you know, matching this, matching that, matching draperies, matching furniture. And it looks like not a lot goes on there in a sense. I mean, it's kind of pretty boring, not very exciting, not very tactile, not very enriching, not very, there's a lot of things that are missing. It's the first place you see when you open your eyes in the morning. It's the last thing you see when you go to bed at night. So even though it's important to be visually enriched by the environment, the tactile quality also has to be there. So I think if people were more in touch with their emotions relative to spaces, they'd be a lot better off. Because of a lack of understanding, a lot of people get into a lot of trouble. They start with something that they like, and then they get something to quote unquote, go with that, and then something to go with that, and then something to go with that, not understanding where they're going. And this happens a lot, far too often. So you have to get a clue about what you're trying to do and writing it down. Ideas, you want to interlock things. So the design is like a Take, for example, a kitchen drawer. Most good quality kitchen drawers and cabinets, the drawers themselves are like dovetail joints. They're not a butt joint, okay? A butt joint is a very simple one. So you want things that are dovetailed or like your, your fingers are interlacing when you want to really hold on to something. Or if you hug somebody, you could interlace your fingers, you know, or whatever. So you want to have that feeling of unity, cohesiveness, flow, rhythm. You get the idea. So again, this comes back to the analogy of music. 
there's an overriding theme. And so the master plan is like the overriding theme. And so you don't want to wander off somewhere and get lost. Like I see so many homes do. They start out good intentions. They start out looking good. And then they start deviating. And that's the point where obviously whoever is working on it, they lack some understanding. I mean, especially in this interior design category when it's so easily infiltrated with designers who kind of know enough to make themselves dangerous. They don't understand all the nuances, all the complexity of creating a work of art in a home. And it's the most personal thing. It's nothing to mess around with and play with. It is the culmination of so many things, your time, your energy, your money. And yet so many people do things I wonder, like, what were they thinking? The obvious is they weren't thinking, or at least not very well. So when you're thinking about this, there are so many people that come in to play, possibly an architect, you know, a builder, definitely an interior designer because we live inside. And so many people build fantastic homes and then you look at the interior and you think, what is going on here? It's like they have a the body of a, let's say, a Rolls Royce, particularly if they're spending a lot of money on a home. And then the interior looks like what? Like they put a Honda interior in the body and frame of a Rolls Royce. It's like this is a disjointed situation. Yeah, it's the seat, but it's not seated properly, if you know what I mean. It's not the right material. It's not the right shape. It's not the right degree of luxury. And so you have to keep a handle on all of this so that it comes out right. So it's always, how do I want to say, it's kind of like a guided missile. Most of the time, and I don't want to say that this is the way it is in or should be in interior design, but it does happen a lot where people get off course, off course, off course, but they don't know how to course correct. And then again, they're off on a tangent. So they start off with a few degrees off at the very beginning of the project. And then over time, they get further and further and further off target, but they don't know it. Well, it's what you don't know that's going to hurt you in the end. And unless you got deep pockets, you know, what are you going to, where are you going to get the money to do it over again? So doing it once right the first time is so very important. There are so many things to consider when you even think about a master plan because the bigger the project, the bigger the outlay of money, the more is involved in it. So even just thinking about master or master plan, you know, I come up with words like look, see, understand, evaluate, plan, decide, commit, implement. One of the beautiful things about a master plan is it balances and harmonizes all the elements that go into it. It's a long range point of view to this extent. We want to know where are we right now? Where do we want to be? How do we want to get there? I really like that concept that a master plan balances and harmonizes all the elements. And not only that, but the long-range viewpoint. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? How do we want to get there? It acts as like an oversight committee. It helps implement things properly. It comes back down to things that I've mentioned in prior podcasts. And we're getting to those P's again, prior podcasts. So prior, proper, preparation, prevents poor 
performance. And then when we're dealing with a master plan, we're dealing with concepts, principles, techniques. It's just very intriguing to think about the word master, master plan, master craftsman, master musician, masterful performance. And that's really what you want it to be. The master plan helps you to create and present and to enjoy a masterful presentation, a masterful event, a stroke of genius in a way. A masterful performance or presentation gets a raving review and a standing ovation. So put some time, thought, and energy into your master plan. It's what it deserves. It's what you deserve, and you're worth it. If you need help, find someone who is a master and masterful with the planning and the implementation of a project. So this means working with someone who has a dream and has vision. And I like to say that vision is not something you see with your eyes. It's something you see with your imagination and your brain. So before you see it with your eyes, you have to see it in your imagination. And you have to see it in really a virtual 3D reality in order to have the supreme confidence that things are going to turn out correctly. Not everyone has that ability whether they be a, a builder, an architect, or an interior designer. So you want to deal with the very best in those particular disciplines and get a team that thinks cohesively like that and shares the same values when it comes to design. And another aspect to the master plan is that it's organic. It's not piecemeal or parts as parts. It's holistic. It's harmonious. It's really notable that master planning takes a lot of thinking, and deeper thinking than most people are accustomed to. Reminds me of a famous quote from Henry Ford. He said, thinking is the hardest work that anyone will ever do, and that's why so few people actually engage in it. Wow, is that ever true? Because it's easy to think when you look at some homes and some interiors and think to yourself, what were they thinking? Obviously, they weren't. You know, there's a certain amount of joy even thinking about the word master, the master, the master key, the master builder, the master carpenter, the master architect, the master interior designer, the master musician, the masterful performance. Wow. You know what? All that denotes excellence. There's nothing average or mediocre about it. So don't let your master planning be average or mediocre. Make sure that it's excellent. Because the results from that activity are going to pay off in dividends beyond description. So just have the vision to see that. So if you can't do the master planning by yourself, find a master who can help you do that master planning so that the result will be masterful and that the end result will bring you a lot of satisfaction and joy. So just remember, if you assemble a group of masters, you'll have a master's team 
And you will also have a group that will form a mastermind. And then you can expect a masterful orchestrated performance as well as a masterful presentation. One of my favorite quotes is on the back of my business card. And it says this, when love and skill work together, expect a masterpiece. Folks, I hope you have the pure enjoyment of working with masters of their craft, whether it be builders, architects, interior designers, put together the right team that's a winning combination. And just like music, you want to be tapping your feet. You want to be dancing through the whole process. You want to celebrate all the results of beauty and elegance. It will be a magnificent, masterful moment. Have a great day.